He says then in moving into 10, he says, for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. So he's expanding on this same thought. And there's a couple of problems here. In the first place, not knowing about God's righteousness. The first mistake in rabbinic Judaism is that they underestimated how righteous God really is. You know, if you understand the absolute perfection of God, then the idea that I could work my way to him is ridiculous. Of course, you know, you shouldn't kill people. But even thinking that you, you know, wished you could or hating someone is just as bad. It's not enough that you tell the truth most of the time. You would have to tell the truth all the time in exhaustive detail to be like God. You just start to realize this isn't doable. And, and that, unfortunately, was missed by the rabbis. So that's why you see Jesus teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. You guys think the law is at this level. Dude, it's really at this level. You're nowhere near making this law. And uh, that all was the result that they did not understand the righteousness of God. The second problem then is seeking to establish their own righteousness. And and so this is exactly what, what they did. They tried to bring God's standards down and then tried to exaggerate their own st- righteousness until you get a nexus there and you think, okay, I'm in. And so uh, when you try to establish your own righteousness, that's called self-righteousness. And that's a it's a pretty good description of what rabbinic Judaism had become. So a critical error any time that we think that we can keep the law and get to God that way. Huge mistake. People still make that today. For, he says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And so we've got a, a totally exciting direct statement here. I can't believe that, uh, you know, we could talk to people down on the street here and ask them what a Christian is, and many of them would come back with, you know, well, they go to church, they obey God, and they're, they're good, try to be good. And they would come back with an answer similar to, to verse 3. They are self-righteous. When in fact, Christ is the end of the law. We're not under law when it comes to God. Instead, as he states in verse 9 God's terms are if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be rescued that's how you come to God it's not by being a good person it's by believing what he has done for you so it's not what we do for God at all we can't do anything for him we cannot buy acceptance from God And the irony is that he's already paid for our acceptance. This is why Jesus went to the cross. So there's nothing left for us to do except to believe what he's done, to accept it as applying to me. And that's what it means to confess Jesus, you know, is to to admit, okay, Jesus' death is what pays for my sins, not me being a good person. And that is the essence of the gospel. That's what we call the good news right there. And so you can start a relationship with God, if you want. It doesn't cost you anything. The price has been paid by Christ. All you can do is believe it and accept it. Believe that God is really as good as he is and accept it. You tell him that in your heart. That's called receiving Christ. You you say, I want to know this. I want to have a relationship with you. And he takes care of it from there. Well, Paul goes on. He says, but I ask, did the people of Israel really understand? Yes, they did. For even at the time of Moses, God said, I will rouse your jealousy through people who are not even a nation, and I will provoke your anger through the foolish Gentiles. So this kind of introduces Paul's hope in this passage. He's hoping that the Gentile body of believers, the church, will be so awesome that the Jews who have not yet accepted Christ will look on and realize, you know, they have it, that that's real, and they'll be jealous, and then they'll believe too and join in. And through this passage, 
several times Paul refers to this, I hope this happens. Well, never did. And one of the problems was that the early church, not long after this time, started to develop a virulent anti-Semitism and actually kind of went to war with the Jews. And so the Jews never saw anything appealing in Christianity, and it's been a real horror story, frankly, ever since. We'll have more to say about that later. Later, Isaiah spoke boldly for God, saying, I was found by people who were not looking for me. I showed myself to those who were not asking for me. And so he's just really calling various passages here from the Old Testament, alluding to the fact that God's saying, I'm going to get out to people way outside of Israel and reach them with the gospel, which is what's happening as he speaks. But regarding Israel, God said, all day long I opened my arms to them, but they were disobedient and rebellious. So what do you think? Why is he bringing that up? Because he's basically saying, uh, this is nothing new. You know, you have a lot of people rebelling against God. Well, that was happening back in Isaiah's day, too. So we shouldn't be surprised. He says, I asked then, did God reject his people? By no means. He says, I'm an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. Of course, Paul was Jewish. He says, God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. That's a real important passage right there. Because in the history of interpretation, in the history of Christian theology, this passage and this entire section that we're reading was completely ignored by the church. To this day, the majority of Christian theologians believe that God has done exactly what Paul says he did not do here, that he has rejected the Jewish people. That's the position of the Catholic Church. That's the position of covenantal or reformed theology, is that the Jews had their chance. And when they rejected Christ, then they were dealt out of the game at that point. That's not what Paul says, is it? He says the antithesis of that. Look at this in the Old Testament. Here's Isaiah 54, God speaking. He says, to me, this is like the days of Noah, when I swore that the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth. So now I have sworn not to be angry with you, never to rebuke you again. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. You see, you know, this is scripture, okay? This is the word of God. And he's saying, look, mountains may fall someday. That kind of thing could happen, but my covenant will never be removed from you. How could Christians reach the conclusion that God has withdrawn his covenant from Israel and given it now to the Gentiles instead? He promises that he will never do that. And so I think this is a huge mistake in theology and it has had devastating effects in the history uh, since the time of Christ up until the present day. 